Okay, good evening everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening webinar. My name is Dr. Devin Singh. And I'm Dr. Alex Kabiri, and we're going to begin with uh, understanding conjunctival anatomy and talking a bit about conjunctival follicles. You know, why this is important is because a lot of times we'll see somebody that has uh, papillae or follicles, and if we haven't really looked at them in a while, you know, it, you might have a hard time telling which is which. And it's important to know which is which because there are much different underlying are very different underlying conditions which you start to consider when doing your differentials when you see the sign of uh, follicles versus the sign of papillae the prognosis can be different from from one to the other and uh, the management plans are usually very different as well depending on what underlying condition you're suspecting so it, it is a nice uh, refresher uh, to uh, to take a look at follicles versus papillae right and you know before we talk about conjunctival follicles it's helpful to understand the anatomy of the conjunctiva because that'll help in explaining the difference between papillae, follicles, and other conjunctival changes. So the goals in this lecture, we're going to be discussing, you know, the anatomy of conjunctiva. It'll help us in understanding the anatomy to help distinguish uh, between papillae and follicles. And we're also going to discuss, you know, what conditions are recognized as appropriate when we have to express conjunctival follicles. We'll also go into how do we express conjunctival follicles, and from a practice management standpoint, you know, we'll explain how to go over the review of the procedure, how to document what's performed, how to counsel patients on the procedure and uh, the treatment afterwards, and how to properly and adequately follow up following the follicle expression. Right. So. Beginning with uh, f key features of the conjunctiva, you know, while we take it for granted, it's uh, nice to, to think a little bit about what it is. A thin, translucent mucous membrane covering the posterior lids and anterior surface of the sclera. It is continuous with the corneal epithelium and also continuous with the dermal epithelium at the lid margin. Uh, we divide the conjunctiva by location as follows, palpebral, vulvar, and fornices. Within the fornices, the conjunctiva is thicker and does fold to allow for eye movement. And uh, while it normally holds seven microliters of fluid, it can hold up to 30. Which is pretty amazing, but I think plenty of us have seen tons of uh, intense chemosis. Sure, sure. And so we know that the conjunctiva has significant elasticity to it. Sure, definitely. The palpebral conjunctiva is very vascular. And it, however, it adheres to the tarsal plate, especially the upper lid. <clears throat> Posterior to the tarsal plate, the palpebral conjunctiva is more loose with horizontal folds that allow for eye movement. So the bulbar conj is the thinnest and loosely attached to the sclera, except for three millimeters around the limbus and near the extraocular muscle attachments. At the limbus, the conj, tenons capsule, and the sclera fuse. This is significant clinically because ophthalmologists in surgery will use that area of the conjunctiva to manipulate eye movement. And for any of us that are co-managing cases with, uh, with surgeons, whether it's perioperative management or other management, you know, a surgeon's reference points are really ana anatomical uh, reference points. So for us to have a refresher of the anatomy and a basic understanding of the, the histologic properties of certain tissues of the eye is uh, definitely very valuable as our profession is moving in that direction. And then we're also going to review a little bit about the glands that are found along the conjunctiva. We're all familiar with goblet cells. Interestingly, these are unicellular glands. They produce the mucin. And as we know with the ocular surface, mucin acts as an anchor to our terophil. Um, the goblet cells, they originate deep in the basal epithelial layer of the conjunctiva. And they slowly migrate upwards towards the surface of the epithelium. When they reach the surface, the cell will rupture, releasing this mucin. And an average person will produce about 2.2 milliliters of mucin per day. Hanley's glands, located between the tarsal plate and the fornix. While not true glands, they do contain goblet cells. Uh, glands of man secreting mucus located on the bulbar conjunctiva around the limbus and accessory lacrimal glands of Kraust and Wolfring. So, you know, one thing that's, that's interesting, if you look at the normal 
the normal distribution of all these glands that produce mucin, you think of meibomian glands, you think of uh, lacrimal glands, accessory, accessory lacrimal glands, there's so much that's devoted to normal and even lubrication of the ocular surface that now when you start to think a little bit about why there's such a fuss made around dry eye, it, it can, it does start to make sense. It also does explain when you do have cases of inflammatory dry eye or early stages of dry eye, we'll often see changes to the conjunctival surface first because we see that all these various glands are scattered throughout the conjunctiva. Layers of the conjunctiva, three distinct tissue layers, epithelium, lymphoid, and fibrous layers. The epithelium does vary. Over the tarsal plate, we see stratified cuboidal or columnar cells. Uh, with the bulbar, bulbar conjunctiva, we see more stratified squamous cells. Near the lid margin, the conj is non-keratinized, an important distinction to make there, non-keratinized stratified squamous uh, epithelial cell, but disease can change this. So when you see keratinization, that's also a, a big clue that something's happening. Why this is interesting also is because the conjunctiva over the tarsal plate has a stratified cuboidal or culinary shape, it will help to understand why follicles and papillae have the appearance that they do. Uh, below the epithelium of the conjunctiva, you have the substantia propia. The substantia propia consists of the adenoid layer and fibrous layer covering the tarsal plate and fornices and also the sclera. The substantia propia consists of connective tissue it's got numerous mast cells, lymphocytes, and neutrophils. The lymphoid nanolayer is thickest in the fornices and absent near the lid margin. Um, interestingly, uh, newborns don't develop lymphoid layer until, until three months. And amazingly, there are over 6,000 mast cells per cubic millimeter of substantia propia, which helps explain why the conj has such a propensity towards allergic reactions. Wow. Uh, the fibrous layer, again, which is the deepest layer, also consists of the conjunctival vasculature, nerves, and glands of Krauss. And here we see, when we look at the image, we can see the different types of uh, epithelial cells you know, becoming uh, more cuboidal columnar cells as they uh, migrate superiorly. Yeah. As, as I was also mentioning before, you know, no, understand that these are columnar and cuboidal helps explain why follicles and papillae will have that round appearance to them. And we're also going to explain how the papillae and follicles will actually originate from tissue in the adenoid layer that pushes upwards through the epithelium. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the vascular and lymphatic supply of the conjunctiva. Uh, arterial blood flow to the conjunctiva con consists of two blood supplies, that anastomose on the bulbar conj, bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, the tarsal arcades and the posterior conjunctival vessels stem from the external carotid, whereas the anterior conjunctiva receives blood flow from the ciliary arteries. And if you remember, the ciliary arteries originate from within the eye and stem from the ophthalmic artery. In regards to lymphatic drainage, the medial conj will drain into the submandibular node, while the lateral conjunctiva will drain into the parotids. Both of them collect deep into deep cervical nodes. Why this is important is it explains why different types of inflammation to the conjunctiva will take on different appearance. Uh, for example, with episcleritis and scleritis, We'll notice that the bulbar conjunctiva is engorged, very bright red, that will fade as you approach the limbus. Whereas in cases of keratitis or iritis, where the inflammation is originating either directly on the cornea or deep in the, within the eye, we'll see the deeper ciliary vessels become dilated. And instead, the anterior conjunctiva is engorged, and we'll see this perilimbal flush, but the lids will oftentimes look pretty quiet.
So characteristics of conjunctivitis, you know, I think we all recognize it when we see it. In the split lamp, uh, we recognize, or when we're sitting across the exam room from a patient, we all recognize that this person has some sort of conjunctivitis. Uh, but the characteristics of it that, uh, that are responsible for that sort of appearance, cellular, cellular infiltration, exudation, which is the escape of fluid, cells, and cellular debris from blood vessels and their deposition in tissues, usually resulting from inflammation. We see vasodilation, keratinization of chronically inflamed tissue, and that's the distinction we made before of non-keratinized versus keratinized epithelium. Uh, we see that if the tissue is chronically infra inflamed, that's one of the clues. If you see keratinization, that's a clue that there's some chronic inflammatory process there. That's nothing new or acute that the patient's just coming in with for the first time. Uh, how do we distinguish follicles from papillae? So this is, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. And why this is important too is because, you know, oftentimes we'll see patients in the office with an inflamed conjunctiva and we have to distinguish whether this condition is infectious, whether it's allergic, whether it's toxic due to medication, whether there's an underlying infection, systemic infection. And a clinical tool is distinguishing whether the patient has a follicular reaction, papillary reaction, whether it's mixed. And so that's why we're gonna go into how we distinguish between these two signs of conjunctival inflammation. So we flip the lids, you see bumps, and then now what are those bumps, right? Are they, are they papillae or are they follicles? You know, I, I know I've heard many colleagues uh, describe when they've seen papillae. I haven't heard too many describe that they've, you know, specifically and confidently seen what are follicles. So to start with, papillae uh, are a hypertrophy of the epithelium pushed into folds with inflammatory cells underneath, pushing superficially with a central vessel. That central vessel is part of a fibrovascular core with vessels branching as they reach the surface. So if you have a fibrovascular core, vessels branching as they reach the surface, under the slit lamp or even just, you know, at, at, uh, if the lid is flipped and you're just looking at, at, the, at the patient, uh, you would expect it to have a, a bit of a reddish hue at least, right? To be more reddish. And we see here in this uh, picture, for example, with papillae, you'll have this round, whitish, elevated lesion with the red vascular core in the center. And then later on, we're gonna discuss, you know, the appearance with follicles. Now, because the fibrovascular core originates in the adenoid layer, and we're also, we also mentioned before, the bulbar conjunctiva has a very, very thin adenoid layer relative to its epithelium and fibrous layer, which explains why we don't see papillae on the bulbar conjunctiva. It's also why we don't see follicles on the bulbar conjunctiva too. So when we speak of follicular reactions, we're focusing primarily on the palpebral conjunctiva. So we continue. Now we've discussed what papillae look like and some of their characteristics. Uh, in contrast, follicles can be more yellow or gray or whitish, discrete lymphoid elevations, approximately half a millimeter to a millimeter and a half in diameter. Uh, we're seeing a hyperplasia of lymphoid tissue, germinal centrally with an avascular core. So whereas papillae had a fibrovascular core, here we're seeing an avascular core with follicles. This core is surrounded by plasma and mast cells, which you, when you start thinking of mast cells, you start thinking of degranulation of mast cells and patients complaining of itching as well. Uh, can be seen on the superior and inferior tarsal conge less often on the bulbar and limbal conjunctiva for the, uh, re the, the reasons that Dr. Singh just mentioned. Now, lymphoid tissue is normally present in the substantia propria except in neonates. And here we see with follicles, we see this yellowish white elevation, but it lacks that vascular, fibrovascular core centrally. So while there, is, while there are patches of redness and inflammation, the bumps themselves are not red. The bumps themselves here are uh, really avascular. They have an avascular core and you're seeing uh, more, more uh, fluid filled. And also it starts to make sense why they take on this whitish appearance too because it's the proliferation of white blood cells. So follicles versus papillae, just to recap, Follicles possess an avascular core. They're a hyperplasia of lymphoid tissue. 
In theory, they're identical to lymphoid follicles in the body. Typically, they're characteristic or hallmark signs of viral infection, chlamydial infection, or a toxic reaction. Toxic reaction could be to a medication, uh, another chemical, or even makeup. Versus papillae, which possess a fibrovascular core with chronic inflammatory cells surrounding blood vessel at their center. Uh, they occur in cases of allergies, contact lens wear, uh, prosthesis. The patient may show that if the prosthesis is not uh, properly maintained or, or poorly fit. Uh, bacterial infection as well. So avascular core versus fibrovascular core is, is uh, one quick sign. Right. Now, if you do see follicles, right, we've seen, we've seen this whitish, yellowish bump. We're confident that uh, these are follicles. You know, now we want to think about, is this a benign lymphoid folliculosis or more of a follicular conjunctivitis? And the way that we might tell, you know, benign, benign lymphoid folliculosis, we think of as clusters of large, non-inflamed follicles in the inferotemporal fornix conge of children. Follicular conjunctivitis, we'll see a redness or enlargement of existing follicles. We might see new follicles, and we may start to see membrane formation. Now, the membranes, you know, we think of fibrin attached to epithelium, uh, and we, we try and make the distinction between pseudomembranes versus uh, true membranes. Um, if you peel, true membranes bleed, and whereas pseudomembranes do not. And the fibrin also comes from the inflammatory response as the blood vessels vasodilate and release the fibrin into the conjunctival surface, they begin to clump together to form this sheet. Now because the fibrin traps inflammatory cells, it traps the antigen, it's important to peel these little membranes periodically when you're dealing with a follicular conjunctivitis. As part of the patient's uh, symptoms are, are due to the, the presence of the membranes themselves and right. the material trapped within. Also, it's helpful to note, too, with you know, benign lymphoid folliculosis in children, you're going to lack the other hallmark signs of inflammation, such as injection, pain, watery eyes. Right, non-inflamed. Non now, in acute follicular disease, here's a patient that comes in complaining of a hyper complaining, you know, with a hyperemic watery eye. They're complaining of discomfort that's associated with, in part, with chondrotival chemosis. Uh, they may say they have photophobia, and they may complain of periorbital pain. Now, often this is often associated with a viral or chlamydial infection. I think many of us have seen a viral conjunctivitis. Um, even if you weren't sure that it was a viral conjunctivitis, if you didn't uh, think to to go and palpate the uh, preauricular node at the first visit. Uh, by the time the patient came back a few days later complaining that not only did the first eye not get better with the antibiotic drop they were given, uh, but now the second eye is involved, by then we usually start thinking, okay, there's something else happening here. You go and you palpate the, the uh, preauricular node. Yes, they have some, uh, some swelling or tenderness there, and then you start putting the pieces together and determine that it's more viral. Uh, if you've seen a handful of these, you might tend to do that on day number one. I know we've seen a lot of right, viral so conjunctivitis yes. uh, in, in our offices. Uh, so viral conjunctivitis, we think of things like EKC, epidemic keratoconjunctivitis. We think of herpetic keratoconjunctivitis. We think of Epstein-Barr virus and also infectious mononucleosis. Uh, chlamydial conjunctivitis as well, inclusion conjunctivitis, we think of. You know, this is not an all-inclusive list. Um, and as, as more time passes and more research is done, some of these lists might grow. So it's important to, to uh, look back, but it's a good start point. You know, also, oftentimes, these different form of viral infections will have a very similar appearance to, and that's mainly because with EKC, with the Epstein-Barr virus, with infectious mononucleosis, these are all adenoviral infections, and we know there are plenty of different strains out there with varying degrees of inflammatory response. And we're going to be focusing later on on uh, chlamydial infections in particular. You know, as we had mentioned before, with the acute follicular conjunctivitis, we have EKC, which is adenoviral. Um, pharyngeal conjunctival fever is also an adenoviral infection. Inclusion conjunctivitis, whether it's in its adult form or neonatal, is caused by the virus, the cl chlamydial trachomatis, which we're, again, we're going to speak a little bit more about later. Um, herpetic keratoconjunctivitis, Epstein-Barr virus, and 
Veratella zoster, these are all within the herpetic family. And there are also a lots of RNA virus infections out there as well, such as mumps, Newcastle, acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, rubella, smallpox, um, molluscum contagium, which are benign viruses that, that lie on the um, dermis of the skin. Oftentimes, at the, near the lid margin, they'll flake off and trigger a follicular conjunctivitis as well. Again, this is a non-exhausted list. You guys are welcome to throw out other conditions that you're familiar with in the chat. Also, if you have any questions at this point regarding what we've spoken about so far, you're welcome to mention them in the chat room. So we talked a little bit about acute follicular disease and now chronic follicular disease. So you think of things like chronic chlamydial infection, uh, trachoma, lymphogranuloma venarium. We also think of toxic or inflammatory responses to, for example, topical medications or infection by molluscum contagiosum. Um, lymphogranuloma vernium, many of us may not be too familiar with, and it makes sense. That's because it's not very common in the in the U.S. or North, North America, but it is caused by a strain of the chlamydial virus. Sorry, chlamydial bacteria. Right. Some of these things, you know, they you you'll only see in parts of the world where you have many many people living together in a small space. Sometimes multiple people occupying one room. Uh, and that's where there's enough, close enough living proximity for not only infection, but repeat infection, which can kind of propagate some of these uh, sequelae that we're going to talk about. Right, and because chlamydia is also an STD, its potential for reinfection is very high in some of these places, which is how it can develop into a chronic follicular conjunctivitis. And as you mentioned before, too, with uh, molluscum contagiosum, because it lives on the surface of the skin, as they grow and pro proliferate and shed, the ocular surface continues to become exposed to it. So potential uh, causes for chronic follicular conjunctivitis, certainly chlamydia trachomatis at the top of the list, uh, moraxella, you may see an angular blepharitis with that, molluscum as we mentioned, Paranoids, oculoglandular syndrome, Lyme disease is a big one, especially up here in the Northeast. Uh, toxic conjunctivitis due to chronic exposure to topical medicines. Makeup, which uh, I, some of us might not always think of as being a, a possible cause of a chronic follicular conjunctivitis. Or environmental pollutants. And again, this is not an allergic response. It is, it is an inflammatory response, but it's not an allergic response in that sense. People will come in saying, oh, I think I'm allergic to my makeup. I think I'm having an allergic reaction. You know, well, they have kind of red, watery eyes. They're complaining of, of itching a little bit as well. Oh, must be. No, take a look. Take a look. Even flip the lids and look and see what, see what you see. You might be surprised sometimes. Uh, masquerade syndromes can consider sebaceous adenocarcinoma. And... Uh, there are there are uh, times if you really if you really look and over the years if you have a moderately high volume practice, uh, moderately high volume patient load and as the years go by if you really take a close look there will be instances where you'll say you know what I'm glad that I flipped the lid and looked and uh, I was surprised by what I saw. All right, so you bring up a good point there. So oftentimes it does make sense to assess the lid margin. You brought the lids to take a look at those meibomian glands when you're encountering a patient who has this chronic conjunctivitis. And for the most part, you notice there's a common theme with the follicular conjunctivitis. By and large, most of them are viral in nature. Um, later on the talk, towards the end, or whenever you guys decide to, if you have a question you want to ask it, we can go, we can go into you know, common treatment patterns for follicular conjunctivitis that's outside of expressing the conscious hypo follicles. So, you know, we think of signs of chronicity. We had mentioned keratinization as a sign of chronicity. You know, granuloma is another one. I mean, in both acute and chronic disease, chronic inflammation uh, can cause granulations to start forming on the conjunctival tissue. Now, a granuloma is an abnormal dense collection of cells forming a mass or a nodule of chronically inflamed tissue. 
Uh, it may be associated with an infectious process, but it doesn't have to be. And you can have patients who've even had, let's say, a pterygium removed, and they, they maybe stopped their post-operative anti-inflammatory medicine too quickly because they were feeling pretty good, and then they'll come in shortly after complaining of this little red mass that's starting to grow in the site of the uh, surgery. And you'll take a look and say, oh, they have a granulation uh, tissue forming there. Can you, any of you think of any other conditions in which case you've encountered a granuloma? I'll give you all a minute to chime in in the chat. A few of our doctors online have mentioned uh, Schlesium or internal hordeolum, which is true with, um, with chronic inflammation due to an internal hordeolum, frequent rubbing. We can also oftentimes see granuloma forming on the inner side of the uh, leg of the palpebral conjunctiva. As opposed to with the pterygium, we'll see the granuloma forming on the above our conch. Um, in our office, depending on the size, we'll either well, we have to resume the anti-inflammatory regimen regardless, but oftentimes, depending on the size, we'll do that alone, or we'll have to uh, have one of our surgeons physically excise the granuloma depending on its size. But regardless, the patient has to resume their anti-inflammatory regimen. If you guys have any other thoughts, you know, please enter them in the chat room now. Aside from a chalazium or internal hordeolum, can anyone think of any other conditions resulting in granuloma formation? Has anyone seen any infectious cases that resulted in granuloma formation? I know some people have seen after uh, pterygium removal, if they use a steroid that's too strong in their post-op regimen that not only controls inflammation but definitely interferes with healing as well, I know some people have uh, seen granulomas form pretty quickly there in, in those cases as well. Now one of our doctors online mentioned another good example of pyogenic granulomas. And these are relatively common skin growths. They can be found on the eyelids and also other parts of the body as well. Okay, moving on in our talk. Um, here's an example of a granuloma 
on the uh, inferior inner palpable conjunctival. Now, when I see this, it looks like something that I've seen very commonly, you know, on, on patients, and it makes me think, oh, yeah, maybe I have seen <laughs> seen these many times before. Uh, I've seen people refer to our office with lesions that look exactly like this, that are granulomas, and uh, they've been referred for the chalazians, uh, things like that, and it's uh, clearly that's that's not what uh, what's happening here. Right, and, and as mentioned before by one of our two of our doctors online, this is an example of where an internal horiolum will form a granuloma on the inner side of the lid. So chlamydial trachomatis, right? So here, this this is important because this is a leading cause of preventable preventable infectious corneal blindness worldwide. So while we're not seeing it too much here, we do see, especially if, if you're in a big city, like let's say we're here in New York, we do see people who come here from all parts of the world. And there are people that we've seen who show signs of having had this. Uh, and the key thing here is that it is preventable and uh, it, it's good to recognize it as well. So usually initiated in early childhood by repeat infection of the ocular surface by C. trachomatis, uh, which to refresh our memories is an obligate intracellular bacterium transmitted primarily in young children by direct contact with the eye, nose, and throat secretions of infected individuals. Usually this is the, the scenario where you have a lot of crowding and overcrowding, and you have many people living in, in uh, very close proximity, sometimes multiple people in one room, and they just cannot escape the, the infected person, and then uh, little kids uh, living uh, or sharing the living space with this person will then, at some point, come into uh, eye, nose, or throat secretions, and therefore get infected, uh, and also be open for repeat infection. Repeat infection causes chronic conjunctivitis, resulting in scarring in later years and continued loss of vision. Without repeat infection, the inflammation will eventually subside. So repeat infection is a key culprit here. Uh, the World Health Organization SAFE protocol has helped to curb but not eradicate this worldwide affliction, surgery, antibiotics, facial and environmental cleanliness. So definitely hygiene is a, is a big part. Right, so it's helpful when you're encountering patients with a suspected follicular conjunctivitis, whether you're suspicious of chlamydia or any other type of inspection, it's important to, you know, discuss hygiene as a way of preventing transmission to other people and also to prevent repeat infections. So looking here at different stages of, uh, of uh, trachomatous uh, infection, uh, first of all, the word trachoma is derived from the ancient word, ancient Greek word and means rough eye due to the cobblestone appearance of the lymphoid follicles that line the conjunctiva. Uh, in each of these images, you'll see the lid is flipped. Again, that uh, reinforces the, the importance and the value of fully flipping a lid and taking a look at a patient with a red watery eye. Uh, there's the, the uh, inflammatory follicular process, then there's the more intense inflammation there. And if we look at the second picture there, the middle picture, we can see more clearly uh, these kind of yellowish whitish bumps that are the follicles. And while there are red patches in between and the overall palpebral cons looks red and inflamed, the bumps themselves are not red, uh, the, the core being avascular. And then end stage disease, trachomatous scarring of the palpebral cons there. And we see here that with, with chronic inflammation, the epithelium of the conjunctiva becomes remodeled. And you will also have a loss of your conjunctival glands, which are necessary for your mucin layer. Um, this will cause that lid wiper disease where you begin to have constant rubbing to the corneal surface, which then will cause symptoms of dry eye and keratitis in patients who have corneal uh, conjunctival scarring and then begins the downward spiral of an inflamed eye, which then becomes more dry and then progressively more inflamed, more dry, the mechanical irritation of the lid wiper syndrome, and uh, down and down it goes. All right, so we see the importance here when dealing with chronic follicular conjunctivitis. It's important to get this controlled in the earlier stages because they're easier to treat as opposed to late stage scarring. So acute and chronic behavior of trachoma. Initial clinical manifestation may be a follicular conjunctivitis, which if not treated in a timely manner, may lead to scarring of the conjunctiva. Again, we're talking about palpebral conjunctiva. 
uh, eyelid and cornea, ultimately causing vision loss. Uh, and the mechanical irritation of the cornea, again, can on, on a chronic basis, can lead to a corneal scarring, which will lead to vision loss. Scarring causes contracture, and this is important too, because when you think of normal blinking and the mechanics of normal distribution of the tear film with blink, well, having normal lid architecture and anatomy is a big part of that. As the scars lead to contracture, which distort the lid margin, leading to entropion, uh, trichiasis, lid retraction, this does set the stage for corneal compromise, chronic mechanical inflammation, uh, subsequent uh, other infections as the corneal surface is compromised and you don't have normal distribution of the tear film and its antimicrobial components, uh, too much corneal scarring, ultimately you have corneal blindness. Um, a question that I want to propose to the audience is, you know, as we're talking about chlamydial infections, can any of you think of other infections you've encountered in practice that have led to scarring of the conjunctiva, not necessarily infectious in nature. It could be inflammatory, it could be toxic due to chemical exposure. Um, you know, please share your experiences with the rest of us via the chat room. And we'll gladly discuss it more before we go forward. We'll give you guys about three to four minutes to input your thoughts in the chat. Thank you. Hi, great, thank you. We have some great feedback from you guys. One of our doctors has mentioned a canthamoeba infection. I'm curious if it was contact lens related, if it resulted in any other scarring, aside from conjunctival scarring. Um, wow, you, one, one doctor encountered a patient who had battery acid in their eye. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know how you doctors manage these cases. Um, you know, please share your thoughts in the chat while we discuss some other yeah. causes of uh, conjunctival scarring. Um, let's consider, you know, certain autoimmune conditions such as ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, or graft versus host disease in patients who have had a um, transplant, perhaps a corneal transplant. Ocular trauma, controlled trauma such as surgery can lead to scarring, whether it was a strabismus surgery or pterygium surgery, you can see conjunctival scarring, uh, thermal injury, radiation treatment, uh, mechanical injury to the conch, you know, a, a conjunctival laceration, chemical insult to the conch, and even some of the conjunctivitis that we might see, like atopic keratoconjunctivitis or even vernal keratoconjunctivitis, can lead to some scarring. I mean, in short, there's not, there are not too many infectious uh, culprits for conjunctival scarring. So, if you're thinking of an infectious culprit for conjunctival scarring, it's probably, you know, C. trachomatis is, is at the top of that very, very short list. 
Um, if you're not thinking that they have C. trachomatis, then it's likely a non-infectious etiology, as, as we had mentioned before. And a big part of that is because of the chronic nature of the disease. In order to have these types of anatomical changes to the conjunctiva, it has to suggest a chronic inflammatory condition, such as the ones that we've mentioned. And like Dr. Kiburi has just said, you know, specifically with chlamydia infections, one of the few infectious conditions that have a chronic nature to it. So now we're going to discuss these stages of trachoma. Um, the typical bacterial incubation period is 5 to 12 days, after which the individual starts to experience symptoms associated with the conjunctivitis. Um, in neonates as well, not mentioned here, is the incubation period tends to be similar, you know, 3 to 12 days. Um, some infants will develop in a reaction up to two weeks later. In, uh, in active disease, especially those seen in preschool age children, in addition to conjunctival follicles, you'll have an irritated eye, watery discharge. Um, with adenoviral infections, the water discharge will be clear, as opposed to conditions such as gonococcal or chlamydia infections, you'll have more of a mucopurulent discharge. Now, in, uh, in an unspecified stage of trachoma, you were not sure exactly what's happening. It could be, it could be any of the above, or it just might not be very clear. Uh, and the late effects of, uh, you know, reinfection and chronic disease, we think of uh, those sequelae as being related to scarring, uh, at which point we refer to it as cicatricial trachoma. I'm curious if any of you have seen uh, patients who have cicatricial trachoma and to have any corneal changes from the, uh, from the trachoma as well. And, and again, I know we have. We have seen some of these folks. Um, I'm thinking now of, of some of the older folks that we've seen from other parts of the world who come in showing signs of lid contracture, a distorted lid margin, entropion, corneal scarring. And, uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, when you flip the lid, you can see, in some instances, the palpebral conotival scarring. So I think we'll agree then, if you see these older folks with these scarring to the kind, it's helpful to ask about a history of chronic infections, chronic conjunctivitis, or chronic red eyes. Because then it's also means it's something to look out for in the future. And being that they may have been infected as children, you know, the person who comes with them, whether it's their own kids, adult children who come with them to, to the visits, uh, you know, they weren't around for any of these early episodes. And, and you know, somebody of very advanced age might not really remember having had eye infections as a small child. Now we're going to take a side step a little bit. We're going to go over some other conjunctival, not so much pathology, but things you'll see on the conjunctival that don't necessarily relate to follicular conjunctivitis. But they are they they do in the sense that they are indicated uh, they are they are recognized indications for possibly needing to express a conotival follicle. So in terms of toxicity, when you look at conotival pigmentations, here we're seeing somebody who has silver deposits in the conjunctiva. This is called argyrosis. In some parts of the world, silver is still used as a preservative in uh, some ophthalmic formulations. And I know we've never seen it in, in uh, our professional time in this country, but uh, it does still happen in some parts of the world. And depending on, on who, where the patient is from, you might see somebody coming in with silver deposits in the conj, uh, a bit of toxicity from which can lead to the uh, formation of uh, a follicular conjunctivitis. Um, we'll give you guys all a minute to, you know, let us know if you've encountered any patients with a similar appearance in the office, and perhaps argyrosis may have crossed your mind. We'll give you all a minute to import your thoughts.
Um, it's interesting to mention too in our patients with congenital arteriosis, you'll also see silver deposits in the lacrimal sac, the lens, and the cornea. And while you might see the silver deposits all over the place, the follicular reaction will be concentrated on the palpebral conch. Mm -hmm. One of our docs brought up a good point. Uh, within our differential, we'll also think nevus avoda, and obviously, you know, you're gonna. Well, oftentimes, we're gonna see nevus avoda far more often than argyrosis. Other causes of conjunctival pigmentary changes uh, will often, will sometimes, we'll see uh, crisiriasis, which is uh, conjunctival gold deposits. And also with the phallus, which is just benign conjunctival menorosis, or freckles on the conjunctiva. And it represents a hyperplasia of the basal epithelium. With no malignant potential, appearing on sun-exposed areas of the conj as flat brown lesions. I mean, we've all seen these things in practice, and uh, you know, I, I've heard some people describe them to patients as, oh, you have sunspots on your eyes. Uh, most common distribution is in the perilimbal region. So looking at normal, normal ephylis, right around here, perilimbal pigmentation, and here we see, you know, skin ephylis uh, by the, the co commonly known as freckle. You're not expecting this person to have, with ephylis, normal, normal uh, distribution of uh, perilimbal pigmentation, you're not expecting them to come in with a follicular uh, conjunctivitis because of that. This would not be an, an etiology of a follicular reaction. One more thing to add to with patients with chrysoriosis, it's oftentimes due to paraenteral administration of gold salts, uh, specifically in patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune conditions. Now we've seen people come from other parts of the world who for one reason or another had a lid retraction and to try and restore the eyelid to a normal position, you know, the surgery that they had was to put gold weights inside the eyelid. And the weights are a little bit heavy and they pull the eyelid down to, to a more normal position and they go on for the rest of their life with this uh, little gold weight in the eyelid. Not expecting that to be uh, a cause um, of, a, of a follicular conductivitis. Also, it's especially more pronounced too when areas of excessive skin exposure to UV lights. Their skin pigmentation will oftentimes be uniformly gray, grayish purple, maybe a, a grayish blue, but it's usually limited to the portion of their body that are exposed. Um, if it involves the conjunctiva over the sclera in particular, Somebody asked a question, should people with normal conjunctival pigmentation be recommended to use sun protection? I think so. I think so. It makes sense too, especially if you're concerned about uh, pinguecula pterygium progression. So lentigo, other dyschromia, a benign melanocytic tumor for which present as sun or liver spots that develop in sun exposed areas of the conjunctiva. Uh, in contrast to the freckle or the ephylis, you know, a lentigo would represent an area of melanocytic hyperplasia within the basilar epithelium. And just like with uh, Nevis of Oda, the distinction between lentigo and other melanocytic lesions is its role as a marker for UV damage and also systemic problems as well.
So here's, here's an example of a chondrotype of granuloma, and this looks very, very much like something that we might see in our office uh, after somebody's had uh, pterygium removal, surgery went great, patients using their post-operative anti-inflammatory and topical antibiotic therapy, and uh, they feel so good that they just stop way ahead of schedule. And then instead of uh, normal tissue having a chance to take its time and cover the area of the surgery, and again, we're talking about pterygium surgery without a graft, just uh, bare sclera, uh, with uh, with mitomycin C, you know, here's here. You, th then you can have uh, kind of a quick patchwork where this granulomatous tissue forms, covers the area, but it's not really normal, and that subsequently may have to be uh, removed as well. So a nice thing if you have somebody, you know, that that you're seeing a conjunctival granuloma, it's good to ask them, did you ever have uh, ocular surgery before? They might say yes. And whereas you'll see follicles really on the palpebral conjunctiva, this type of granuloma is not limited uh, to the palpebral conj. It can really be on the bulbar conj, the palpebral conj, I either. And oftentimes in patients who are in their post-op period after the pterygium surgery, um, we'll see this if they prematurely stop their anti-inflammatory regimen. Right, and the important thing then is to quickly get them back on their anti-inflammatory regimen, get them on good uh, lubrication as well to limit mechanical irritation of, uh, and, and drying out and, and inflammation related to, to dryness of the uh, granuloma. Uh, and then when everything has kind of stabilized itself, you know, back to the surgeon to take a look and consider uh, possibly excision of the granuloma. Yeah, with, with the post op period, scarring is really critical here too. We mentioned conjunctival scarring before on the palpebral conjunctiva. Um, this would be an example of where conjunctival scarring on the bulbar conch can, if it's severe enough, can potentially leave a person with an exotropia or, a, or a, devi a, a deviation towards the side of the surgery. Yeah. As, as the scar tissue forms and contracts, the contracture can actually pull the eye towards the, the uh, side that sur on which the surgery was done, and somebody might come back saying, you know, it's, I cannot, when I look to my left or right side, whichever, what have you, uh, I see double. And in extreme cases, on primary gaze, they'll see double. And it makes sense, because if you think about it, as you mentioned before, based on the anatomy of the conjunctiva, it's designed to be loose and flexible to allow mobility of the globe. And with scarring, you have reduced mobility. We'll give everyone another two minutes if you have any questions regarding any of the pigmentary changes we mentioned about the conjunctiva, whether it's ephylis, chrysiosis, argyriosis. We'll give you all a minute right now to throw your questions out there. We can address them before we move on to discussing expression of conjunctival follicles. Okay, we'll give everyone three minutes.
Okay, before going into the expression of conjugate type of follicles, we're going to summarize what we've discussed so far. Uh, first, we talked a little bit about the anatomy of the conjunctiva. Uh, we discussed how uh, the differences between the bulbar cons and the palpebral conjunctiva. Bulbar cons is the adenoid layer is significantly thinner. The cons overall is a thin translucent mucous membrane. And the bulbar conj and the palpebral conj are continuous. We think of the conj as having three regions, palpebral, bulbar, and fornix. Uh, the histologic differences between the bulbar and palpebral conj in terms of the thickness of the adenoid layer account for some of the differences that you'll see in terms of follicles mostly on the palpebral conj versus not on the, on the bulbar conj. Uh, we talked a little bit about how anatomically the, the conjunctiva, tenons, and uh, sclera fuse at the limbus. Uh, we also talked a little bit about why when there's corneal or intraocular inflammation, you'll see a perilimbal flush, whereas when there's more of a uh, bulbar conjunctival, you know, inflammation, you might see more of a perilimbal sort of uh, looks clear, the perilimbal region. And as you move a little bit further away, it gets a little bit more, uh, you start seeing the signs of inflammation. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, how the conj can get very, very chemotic. We talked about the distribution of glands within the conjunctiva uh, in terms of mast cells, as well as uh, we talked about many glands that are necessary for the lubrication of the eye, goblet cells, uh, accessory lacrimal glands, uh, other mucin-producing glands like glands of man's, um, you know, and uh, we talked a bit about the difference between the, the uh, epithelial cell types at different layers and different depths leading up to cuboidal and columnar cells near the, uh, as they get to the surface of the conjunctiva. We talked a bit about papillae and about follicles and how depending on where, which part of the world patients are from, it is good to flip the lid, especially if you see a distorted lid margin and take a look for signs of uh, follicles. Key hallmark differences between papillae and follicles we had said were papillae, fibrovascular core, uh, thinking of things like uh, contact lens related uh, and, and other things like that versus follicles which have more of a uh, lymphoid etiology and uh, they have an avascular core uh, looking, instead of looking reddish, looking more kind of yellowish, whitish, maybe a little bit grayish uh, and etiologies that are more viral infectious in nature or chlamydial in nature. Um, we think of toxicity as well. Silver is an example. Makeup's an example. Uh, prolonged use of certain ocular medicines could be an example as well. Uh, and we also talked a little bit about the signs of chronic inflammation. We talked about keratinization. We also talked about the appearance of granulomas. So I'm just summarizing all this because it's a lot. And, you know, sometimes we might not think of putting all these things together. Like if you see... Uh, you know, a granuloma, if you see keratinization, this tells you that there's some chronic inflammatory process going on. Let's dig a little deeper. Let's flip the lids and see what we see. Do we see some signs of chondrotival scarring? Let's look at the lid margin. Do we see some signs of contracture and distortion of the lid margin? Uh, do we see, if we have, if we look at the upper part of the cornea, maybe some, some panis or a bit of superficial corneal scarring starting? Well, then let's flip the lid and let's take a look. Do we see some palpebral conjunctival scarring now that could say, oh, this patient might have had a late stage trachoma and if they continue without having this managed, then this can likely lead to, you know, prolonged recurrent uh, mechanical irritation and ultimately some degree of corneal blindness. And we're talking about all these different forms of management too because before we express conjunctival follicles, chances are we're going to be managing their follicular conjunctivitis either topically with medication and understanding the source of the inflammation is necessary in order to form our treatment and management plan. Um, by and large, if the infection is herpetic in nature, depending whether it's herpes zoster, herpes simplex, if it's the Epstein-Barr virus, um, we may have to use an antiviral, particularly if we're worried about a corneal involvement or if there's an iritis. For adenoviral infections, oftentimes I'll educate the patient that depending on the strain of the adenovirus, this could either, it's always self-limiting, 
but the degree at which the patient is uncomfortable will dictate how we manage the inflammatory signs. So Dr. Singh, let me ask you this one. So a patient comes in, you believe they have an adenoviral infection. Now the only topical, we only have really maybe two topical uh, antivirals that, that we can have access to in the US. Uh, does it make sense or there, is there anything to support in an adenoviral infection, maybe giving some topical antiviral therapy? And if so, is there one product over the other? Um, I've heard of any adenoviral cases with, uh, with Zergan helping okay. with uh, adenoviral infections. So we've, we've heard of uh, and, and read a couple of studies of uh, gan topical gancyclovir maybe being helpful in some cases of adenoviral infection in terms of shortening the length of the length of the disease and the severity of the disease process. That's outside of the indication. That would be an off-label use. Um, you'd have to make that determination on your own, but uh, there, there are some studies floating around that support the use of uh, gang, topical gangcyclovir in those cases. And also, in addition to expressing these follicles, sometimes I'll often choose to use a topical corticosteroid or a topical non-steroidal as well. Um, the question may be, you know, how does... How does uh, using topical NSAIDs or corticosteroids affect your management plan if you're going to be doing expressions of cognitive follicles? How do some of the doctors that are listening, you know, please uh, share with us how you will manage your patients with a viral uh, follicular conjunctivitis or carotid conjunctivitis? Right, so before we go on, we change gears here and go on to the procedure of expression and when it might make sense to do it and how to go about doing the procedure as well as documenting it and following up with them. You know, up to this point, you have a patient who comes in with what you believe to be a, a uh, follicular conjunctivitis of viral etiology. You know, how, how are we managing that patient up to this point before we get to the point of uh, considering expression of conjunctival follicles? You know, do you ever use topical NSAIDs, topical antihistamines, topical corticosteroids? Is there a timing to your treatment and management? Is it all palliative, just tears, tears, and cool compress, come back in a couple of weeks? You know, what, what are we telling this patient? And how are we managing them short of expression, which we'll get to next. We'll give you all three minutes to share your thoughts in the chat, and we'll all address it together. I know I've seen people referred in to our office for evaluation of, of uh, what the referring doc called an inflamed pinguecula, which was way, way, way over in the medial aspect of the eye, not quite where you'd expect to find a pinguecula, and uh, it's actually a granuloma, but they saw a red bump on the ocular surface and just called it a pinguecula. So it, it's nice to know because the management plan would be different, right? You would tell one patient, wear sunglasses, use lubricants, and occasionally you know, use anti-inflammatory therapy, and the other patient might actually need surgical excision of the granuloma. I myself, when I'm seeing a case of viral conjunctivitis that's mild to moderate, I'll use a combination of a topical NSAID and a topical antihistamine. If they're more symptomatic, more complaining of pain or significant injection, I maybe introduce a corticosteroid, but I'll also educate the patient that this can prolong the infection. So I think the first thing that I'm telling a patient that I suspect has a viral conjunctivitis 
is that while they're complaining of one eye today, it's very likely that the second eye is on its way to becoming involved as well. Also, I let them know that this is very contagious and it can run. Yeah, one of our doctors has asked, you know, if we've ever used Zergan in cases of UKC in the office and if we have any results to show. Uh, no, no results to show. You know, again, that's that's an off-label use. There were a few studies around. You know, if if you look it up, that are that are s suggest that it might help, um, but it's nothing really solid to stand on. You know, not, there are not solid, repeatable studies to show that it definitely does help. And for that reason, we don't use that as a go-to for uh, for adenoviral conjunctivitis in in the office. Um, while it could make sense in some studies, or depending who you ask, it could make sense. Uh, it's not something that uh, we normally do or routinely do. Yeah. I'd imagine if I had a patient with a severe EKC developing, you know, dense pseudomembranes, I'm throwing at them topical NSAIDs, topical combination corticosteroid and antibiotic drop, and all else hasn't worked, I would imagine trying a Zergan in conjunction. Yeah, with those I mean, other forms it, of treatment. It's something that's in the toolbox, you know. Mm -hmm. And if if you have if you have studies to support it, I guess you could you could support it if you had to. But uh, well, you know, patient education is important in explaining that too, right? Yeah, hugely yeah. important, hugely important. If you're giving somebody a medication for an off-label use, you know, many patients will go home and read the packaging, uh, and if what their understanding is of their condition is not in line with the indication, the the manufacturer's indication for the therapy. Um, you know, you want to prime them on that ahead of time. Otherwise, they might fear that you gave them the wrong medication, not use the therapy, and therefore progress, end up a bit worse. Uh, as I was starting to say before, you know, I like to educate patients that if, they, if I believe they have a viral conjunctivitis, that uh, it is very contagious, and they, it, it can run through the whole house. So it's, it's important for them not to just share medication with family members who show up with a red eye in, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, those people really should be seen to confirm exactly what's happening. They should be monitored as well uh, for adverse effects of the medication or undesired effects of the medication, as well as resolution of the underlying condition. Right. I mean, we've had cases where one patient will come into the office, the next week their sibling will come into the office, then their parent or their grandparent, and all, and all due to the uh, contagious aspect of uh, adenoviral infections. Okay, so scarring of the conjunctiva, as we said, said, late effects of trachoma, as well as other scarring of the conjunctiva. Other scarring, as we had mentioned, uh, physical injury, chemical injury, uh, surgery can lead to scarring of the conch, as well as AKC or uh, VKC can lead to scarring of the conch. Uh, so we're, what we're seeing here, we're seeing diagnoses that are considered or recognized for the procedure of expression of conjunctival follicles. Now, there is a procedure code for expression of conjunctival follicles, and we'll see that a lot of this has to do with trachoma, but also acute follicular conjunctivitis, uh, conjunctival pigmentations, with that can lead to a to a formation of conjunctival follicles, granuloma of the conch, which can also lead to, you can have follicles around it, and conjunctival scarring as well. Now, going back to granuloma, a question I was asked previously, is when you're doing expression of conjunctival follicles, are we expressing the granuloma? No, and if, we, if we're doing it for conjunctival scarring, we're not expressing the scar. And if we're doing it for conjunctival pigmentation, we're not expressing the pigment. Right, so again, we're expressing the follicles that may be associated with this pathology. And again, why are we doing this? And it's to shorten the disease course. That's it. It's, it's a similar concept to, let's say, peeling membranes, where you might peel membranes uh, or pseudomembranes just to help the patient feel more comfortable as within those layers of uh, fibrin you have inflammatory material trapped as well, inflammatory chemicals trapped as well, uh, which can keep the patient feeling very, very symptomatic and keep the eye looking very inflamed. Uh, peeling the membrane can shorten the severity of what the patient's experiencing and uh, shorten the course as well of, yeah. of the negative aspects of what they're experiencing. Similarly here, expressing the follicles can shorten those things as well. Uh, and we see here that it's a billable procedure and it can be performed by optometrists in right. New York. It is a recognized procedure that can be performed, so it's, it's something to be familiar with. Okay, so more or less how it, how it goes, 
Uh, expression of conotidal follicles, more or less, uh, you know, tetracaine or lidogel is preferred, but if you don't have access to it, proparacaine can be used instead, but it may require a repeat installation. Proparacaine really doesn't work that well on the palpebral conch. Uh, it's much, it's great on the cornea, but it's not that good on the palpebral conch. For that reason, tetracaine or even better, lido, lidogel is uh, preferred, performed. Acten, made by Acorn, is that's a 3% lidocaine gel, which is widely commercially available. Uh, it's nice to have the patient come in, sit down for a few minutes. Certainly gloves are recommended, especially if you're thinking that there's a viral uh, etiology there or an underlying cause that could possibly be contagious. It's nice to have, uh, and, and you're dealing with body fluids, so proper uh, infectious uh, prevention protocol should be followed. Gloves are recommended. Evert the lid, and with two cotton tip applicators, gently squeeze each follicle. So we're not, this, just, just the thinking about, about what this procedure is, averting the lid and then gently squeezing each follicle, uh, it's uncomfortable. So we're, we're looking at if you have a relatively comfortable patient, if you have somebody who is uh, not really bothered by the presence of these follicles, you can probably go about managing this condition another way. If you have somebody who is really complaining of, uh, of discomfort and itchiness and you see there are follicles all over the place and you know that there's a lot of inflammatory material that's there, uh, if you can get that material off the surface of the lids and therefore off the surface of the eye, you can have them feeling quite a bit more comfortable. So you're, you're sort of removing a causative agent of the symptoms, not the causative agent of the sign of follicles, but the causative agent for patient symptoms, you're, you're helping to minimize that. Uh, so again, have the patient sit for a few minutes. Now you can pretreat. I think a lot of times when we do things to the ocular surface, we might give uh, antibiotics to the patient, maybe a bit of an anti-inflammatory drop as well, uh, in addition to the, uh, the you know, an anesthesia, the topical anesthesia. Uh, evert the lid, gloves are on, and with two cotton tip applicators, you know, gently squeeze each follicle. Uh, go over the entire palpebral conch in this manner, upper and lower for one eye and or the other eye. Spatulas or similar tools may be used if needed, if you need to kind of scrape away any, any uh, material that exudes. And as you had mentioned before, you know, you're going to be doing this procedure on someone who's not in excessive amounts of pain. This won't be a patient who you've just peeled a pseudomembrane off of them. Right. It, you, this is somebody who's very uncomfortable and they're going to go through something that's a little bit uncomfortable as well in the interest of feeling better sooner. Um, does anyone listening so far have any questions about the pre-treatment, either about any of the drops or anything in particular about the actual procedure? We'll give you all a minute to send us your questions. And if, anyone's, if anyone has experience having expressed conjunctival follicles uh, and would like to share, please, this is a great time to do that. Uh, one of our doctors, you know, has the question, you know, will this cause the patient to bleed? It's a potential, particularly if the follicle is adjacent to a blood supply and okay. you manage to rupture that vessel. The palpebral conch bleeds very easily. I mean, if you've ever removed a foreign body from the palpebral conch, uh, you know, we, it, it's not uncommon after removing the foreign body to see that at the site of the foreign body removal, just from you know mildly abrading the adjacent uh, palpebral conch, or just from the the foreign body having been present itself, that you see a tiny bleed. 
you know, and that they have uh, the, the, a tiny bleed for a very, very short time that subsides while they're still in the office. Similarly, when you peel membranes, you'll, you'll likely see a bit of bleeding, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not a huge amount of bleeding. But for these reasons, again, it comes back to proper you know, infection uh, prevention protocol being in place. Gloves are, are definitely recommended. And also it's self-limiting self as well, the bleeding. So one, one doctor asked if there's a risk of uh, cross or secondary infection when, when doing this procedure. I think when you do any procedure to, to a patient, there's always the risk of, uh, of, of introducing, especially if it's non-sterile, let's say, and Q-tips are not really a sterilized agent, you're not getting them out of the autoclave, right? I mean, they're coming out of being, being individually wrapped, if, if that. Um, I've, I've been in offices before just visiting where I've seen, you know, just a bag with a lot of uh, cotton tip applicators in it, half, half cut. Um, and you know the bag just sits there open in the same it's multiple hands go in and out of it to grab cotton tips so that's that's not preferred but that's what some people have so you know if uh, q-tips not being sterile definitely there's the con there's a, a risk of introducing bacteria that weren't present before uh, part of the pretreatment can be topical antibiotic drops in the office prior to the procedure uh, cleaning the lids beforehand as well can be nicely done in the office as well um, and sending them home you know you're managing the the inflammation you're managing uh, as, as part of the post procedural regimen you know we will get to that but yes there is a role for antibiosis in the post procedural uh, regimen for the patient again just to to protect against this risk of cross or uh, super infection secondary infection We'll give the doctors another two minutes to yeah, throw out any, any questions or thoughts you have so far about the procedure itself before we go on to the post-operative management. Yeah, take a, minute and take, take a minute and think about it because I think this, the, you know, these are things that we see, these are conditions that we know about, these are signs that we see, but we might not have thought about really what, in what direction these signs are pointing as to possible history and... Uh, and possible endpoint if left unchecked. Um, and you know, sometimes we all want to make our patients feel better. I don't think any of us really feel good having the same people coming back repeatedly in a short period of time complaining of discomfort. And it's not a good look for your waiting room either when you have the same people there complaining, you know, within earshot of, of new patients about how they keep coming back and not feeling better. So it's a nice thing just to, to know how to do and to have uh, in your arsenal. Um, and you weigh, you know, just like anything else, you weigh, you weigh pros and cons, you explain risks, benefits, and alternatives to the patient. Uh, and this is really for the patient that's in significant enough discomfort to where it makes sense to, to do something that's potentially a little uncomfortable to get them to feel better a bit sooner. Right. Another reason why it's a great technique also is if you think about it, when we're dealing with patients who have a viral conjunctivitis, we really don't have any other tool that can shorten the disease course. Our topical corticosteroids will lengthen it. Our Antibiotics will only prevent a uh, secondary bacterial infection. And says will only and antihistamines will only manage these symptoms. So here we have an actual tool where we can shorten the disease course and allow all these therapeutic options to be more uh, mo that that relieve the symptoms to be more effective by removing one of the causative agents, which is uh, these follicles that just are, are filled with this inflammatory material. Okay, we'll give everyone just another minute to share your thoughts. We appreciate the comments so far.
And the question one of our audience members has asked is, is it repeatable? If I express follicles this week, can I express it again during the same disease course? Yeah, it's 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 repeatable. It's repeatable uh, procedure. And the, like we said, because you're a vernalid, you're applying pressure to the inflamed conjunctiva. It's it's good to mention to the patient that it may be a bit uncomfortable, and patient selection is also really important here too. Because again, if you're with, dealing with a patient who's already in excruciating pain and discomfort, you may want to hold off on doing this in the immediate future. Right. So one, one uh, management tool that's often overlooked and is useful for an array of conditions, and especially if there's been recent pterygium surgery or something like that, uh, is the application of a cold compress or an ice pack. That's definitely very helpful. You get some nice vasoconstriction. And when you think of the, the uh, vasodilation as part of the, uh, the, the inflammatory process, you're getting a leaky vasoendothelium and you're getting the migration of fluid. And with that fluid, the uh, migration of inflammatory cells and the, the sequelae that they bring on uh, right to the ocular surface and to the, uh, if, if you can vasoconstrict the patient a bit in a harmless way by way of ice packs, by way of ice packs, uh, you can, you can uh, have less migration of fluid, less leaky vasoendothelium, and less migration of pro-inflammatory mediators to the surface of the eye. Uh, you know, when, if, if you want to uh, reduce the risk of bleeding, one thing you could do is use a bit of phenylephrine beforehand, as that'll get some local vasoconstriction, and therefore you'll, have, you'll be less likely to have the patient uh, as a bleeder. Right, and oftentimes we'll do administration of phenylephrine prior to removing granulomas in the office for the same reason. And so it'll be helpful in these circumstances as well. Right, so we think, we're thinking of expression, you know, now excision, do they ever need to be excised? The pictures that we saw of uh, follicles did not show them as, as being big enough to really warrant excision. But if you have, you know, big chronic follicles and you have the patient coming back and every time you you know, this is just a recurrent thing where uh, expression is uh, after expression after expression. Is, is, is it going on? Might it make sense to for them to maybe see an oculoplastic doctor and consider perhaps excision of some of the, uh, the the ones that are making the patient more symptomatic? It might make sense. And also because of the follicles are, you know, deep to the epithelium, it may be difficult to do excisions repeatedly without causing scarring as opposed to a granuloma, which is above the conjunctival surface. So any procedure that we do, right, whether it's punctal plugs, removal of a foreign body, uh, expression of uh, conjunctival follicles, whatever it is, we need to indicate in our notes what it is that we intend to do and why. We want to make sure that we did discuss risks, benefits, and alternatives with the patient and that the patient consents to the procedure and understands what the therapeutic goals are, what the treatment goals are. Uh, you, if you can get that in, in writing by way of uh, you know, a consent form, that's ideal. And then you wanna make sure that you document what did you use? What type of anesthesia did you use? Did you use proparacaine? Did you use tetracaine? Did you use 3% lidogelly? Did you use any you know, topical antibiosis beforehand? Did you, uh, you know, did you use something as simple as gloves? You know, did you use uh, a spatula? Did you use Q-tips? You know, what, what is cotton tip applicators? What tools did you use? Uh, did you do the right upper lid first? Did you do the left lower lid last? You know, what were the order in which you did things? Uh, did you run into any complications? Or was the procedure, you know, for the most part uncomplicated? and well tolerated by the patient? Or did you run into some complication, you know, where you had to stop and, uh, you know, manage the complication at that point? These are, these are important, important notes because, you know, when people have had something done, and any of you, do, any of you guys who do uh, perioperative management, right? You know, especially of, of cataract patients, what's the most common thing that I think they come back complaining about in our office? It's floaters. Things that they had already 
that they were not aware of because they weren't getting the, the creation of shadows the same way as they had this cataract diffracting and, and limiting the light entering the eye instead of focusing it neatly, they were not, they were not getting the same formation of shadows and they weren't as aware of the floaters. While we might have noticed it during an eye exam, they might have said, oh, I don't notice it. Day one, after cataract surgery, they come back, what is all this stuff floating around? Oh, you had these before. No, 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 no. And then several, you know, down the line, they'll still attribute the floaters to, you know, I had surgery and now you guys left me with a new problem of floaters. So we want to explain ahead of time all these things to patients. But getting back, getting back to, uh, to the expression of follicles here, we want to make sure that uh, anything that was existing before, the patient knows about, um, what are the normal adverse effects to expect, such as discomfort, if you give them a combination antibiotic steroid ointment, for example, as part of your post-procedural regimen, which you want to document as well, your post-procedural regimen and when you intend to follow up with the patient, uh, you know, that the ointment might blur their vision, they might attribute the blurry vision to the procedure, you don't know. So you want, you, want, you want to do that because sometimes if they don't understand, they won't come back to you and complain. They'll maybe say, let me go get a second opinion. I'm going to go somewhere else. And who knows what that person will tell them, you know, if they, especially if they don't understand what procedure you've done. Uh, they, they might not manage it very well. They might not explain what they think you've done very well. And it could just lead to ultimately problems for the patient. Right. And the, the analogy we mentioned before with the floaters with post cataract surgery, I'm going, it's very important to, in addition to explain expectations to the patients, when you're going over their risks and benefits, you know, the risk we had mentioned before is there's a risk of bleeding, uh, there's a potential risk that this won't shorten the disease course, depending on how well you're able to express the content of the follicles. Uh, patients have to understand, too, that the follicles themselves aren't the cause of the disease. Although we're attempting to shorten the duration, we're not providing them with a cure for their infection. Um, again, one of the benefits of doing the causal expression is to shorten the disease course, but it's not guaranteed. So, post-procedural notes, right? Was the procedure well tolerated by the patient and uncomplicated, or were there complications? Did you instill any, any post-op medications in the office? For example, uh, did you put, I know some people after they put punctal plugs like to put a teardrop in the eye. Make a note of it. Anything, you know, you gave them a medication of some sort. Even if it's an OTC medication, you did. You administ administered by the doctor. Make a note of it. Uh, and the procedural notes should be separate from your normal exam, uh, your normal exam sheet. You should have a, a kind of a, a quote unquote procedure sheet that you use or in your, in your EHR, at least make a separate note that's separate from the exam. You know, so it's uh, it's it's very clear that uh, what you what you're doing. Right. Now, note, like we said again, we'll include, you know, what we intend on doing, patient consent, you know, the fact that we discuss the various risks and benefits with the patient, um, the different drops that we use in the office, and what we're giving the patient to take home. So post procedure, antibiotic therapy is is uh, is wise because again we did something to the eye, we did to introduce tools to the eye, we did touch the eye, uh, and it's. You know, if you're using Q-tips, again, they're not sterile, right? So there is the risk of, uh, of, of a secondary infection or a cross-infection. Um, if you're giving antibiotic or perhaps combination antibiotic steroid uh, treatment, ointment, you know, it's nice to bring them back after a week. And your post-procedural counseling should inform the patient of the potential of mild discomfort uh, that's related to the underlying condition and also to the procedure. Uh, blurring of vision from the ointment, as we had mentioned, and the underlying condition still needs to be managed, as that's still its own independent entity that is not due to the follicles, rather the follicles were a manifestation of that, and then the, their discomfort was largely due to the presence of the follicles. Uh, right. For example, like in the case that we're using here with clinical trichomotis, we want to make sure that if the patient needs oral antibiotics, they're on that regimen as well. Sure. A nice thing to do if you have the staff in place for it or if you have the time yourself, it's a nice thing to do after doing any procedure to a patient and the patient really appreciates it, phone them the next day. You know, you schedule a one-week follow-up, that's fine, but call them the next day, just a quick call, hey, this is Dr. X or, you know, this is uh, so-and-so from Dr. X's office just calling to see how you're feeling today. Uh, you know, the doc hopes you're feeling well. If you can, kindly give us a call back and we'd just love to, to uh, hear from you. Thank you. And document that that call was made. Um, you know, follow up one week post op, follow up with the patient, 
if uh, systemic management is needed, again, make sure that you're co-managing you know, with, uh, with the primary doctor. That's, that's good. And it's always good to send a consult report to the PCP because when they go to their primary doc and explain I had something done, the primary doc is going to say, what did you have done? Good luck having the patient you know, explain that they had, oh, well, I had expression of chondrotidal follicles under topical anesthesia, and then I had topical antibiotic steroid combination therapy for a week thereafter, uh, but I still need management of my underlying disease. Good luck, good luck getting that explanation from the patient. And it's not a fair expectation to place upon them either. Um, consult report to the physician, is, to the primary doctor is, is great. It makes their job easier, which is going to help the patient get a better result. And it definitely builds your credibility as their primary eye care provider. Let's also keep in mind too, just similarly with uh, herpes zoster, a lot of these patients will be going to their primary care doctor before they come to you anyway. And particularly if the primary care doctor referred them to you, it's out of professional courtesy and it's also a good practice builder to send those consultation reports. So now we're gonna go over a case with a patient who had an acute follicular conjunctivitis and we suspected it was a viral origin. Sorry, just a quick, quick, sorry, sorry, Dr. Singh. Quick note about um, consult notes. It can be as simple as, you don't have to do it the way you did it when you were in school, you know, you know, a three or four page letter, typing one finger at a time, you know, you don't have to do that. Uh, it can be as simple as you more or less dictate what you want into your phone, um, email it to yourself, print it on your office letterhead, of course, correct the typos and make sure that the, the words are the intended words. Proofread it, correct it as you need to, and, uh, and print it. It'll save you a lot of time and it'll make sure that it gets done. In many instances, you can do it before the patient leaves the office and they can leave with the report. Thank you, Dr. Kaviri. Going back to the example that we're going to begin with now, let's say we have a patient with an acute follicular conjunctivitis that comes into our office, and we're going to, in summary, assume that this is viral in origin. So we've ruled out other etiologies, such as allergic conjunctivitis, bacterial infection, other forms of a systemic disease that require co-management. And let's say we decide that we want to perform expression of these follicles. Because, as it's not written here, but it, it, should, be, uh, it should be understood that if we're going to go ahead and express the follicles, this is a very symptomatic patient and we're attributing that a lot of their symptoms are due to the presence of the follicles and that expressing them will alleviate, should alleviate their symptoms to some degree. Right, so part of our patient counseling is explaining the purpose of the expression is to shorten the disease course, shorten the duration of symptoms, and hopefully leave the patient on the road to recovery sooner. Um, once the procedure is performed in the office, the patient is sent out with their appropriate medications, um, we, sent, we mentioned before, you know, prescribing and topical ointments, antibiotic, corticosteroid combination will, can be helpful. Sure. And we also want to stress the importance of returning for follow-up in a week. Now, when we're talking about, you know, potential viral etiologies, right? You know, of course, what's the one, one of the ones that we all want to make sure we don't give somebody steroids, you know, for while they're having an acute episode is herpetic, uh, you know, keratoconjunctivitis. So it's nice to make a note if the cornea is clear and the AC, the anterior chamber is clear because if they have uh, some degree of unilateral SPK with an AC reaction, you know, you could assume or should assume some people would argue that there's a herpetic component there. Uh, and it's not impossible for them to have it bilaterally. We've seen it. Dr. Singh's seen it. I've seen it too in, in, in different patients. It's not the norm, but it can happen. So if the cornea and AC are clear, make a note of it. And at least in, in knowing that you have to make that note, um, you'll take a careful look at it to make absolutely sure that you're not going to worsen this patient's condition. Plus, I think most doctors would agree, too, if you do have a patient with active corneal disease, iritis, you may want to manage that first before attempting to express congenital follicles. And also, like we said before, depending on the suspected etiology, you're going to send the patient a note for their primary care doctor regarding what was performed in the office and your co-management plans. Sure. And if you know, if you have some suspected etiologies, mention them in that note. Uh, you know, you're, uh, what are we looking for? We're looking for things like uh, distortion of the lid margin for, due to contracture from scarring of the palpebral conge. 
we're flipping the lids and looking at the palpebral conge. Uh, we're looking for corneal scarring as well. We're looking for all these things. And if it, if it gives you any suspected etiologies, it's nice to point the PCP in the right direction and at least they'll know what sorts of conditions they're checking for and then they can, they can uh, get, get that end of the spectrum going. Right. So I want to thank you all for sitting in on our webinar. We're approaching the end now. We have another five minutes left before we take a short break and begin our next talk. And which is on floaters. And it, it's been a lot of material. We're going to leave this five minutes for you guys to ask some questions, and then we'll come back uh, in five minutes' time and start to answer some of those questions. Okay, so we have some good questions coming up in the chat. One of our doctors asked, um, can the condition be unilateral? With a unilateral follicular conjunctivitis that remains unilateral throughout its disease course, 
I tend to think more of uh, herpetic infection, such as uh, herpes zoster or herpes simplex. With infections that are endoviral in nature, or in this example, uh, chlamydial trachomatis, it tends to be bilateral. A um, very good question, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, would you culture a suspected trachoma? Um, for the most part, we tend to order a blood panel to diagnose someone with trachoma. And, and I, I think we're involving the PCP uh, as part of that process as well. Because once we get the result, we're not managing them from a systemic standpoint. So the PCP should be involved in that as well. Okay, thank you all again for sitting in on our webinar. We appreciate having you. Um, again, my name is Dr. Devin Singh. And Dr. Kabiri. Um, if you're sticking around for our next talk, it will begin in another 10 minutes. And we'll be back. Thank you.